dispensationalism or just different timelines and ages of how God deals with people in different times and different ages uh, through the Old Testament, the New Testament, the tribulation, and then in the millennial reign. So this morning we're not going back into that. That's where we were last week. We're going to pick the narrative back up in chapter 2 and verse number 10. Now Ephesians chapter 2, we've told you we're breaking this down into three different parts. The first Three verses we saw sin's work in us. And then from verse number 4 all the way down through verse number 17, we'll see the Savior's work for us. And then from verse number 18 down through verse 22, we'll get to that next week, we'll see the Spirit's work through us. So uh, hopefully by next week we'll be out of chapter 2, jumping into chapter number 3. This morning we'll start in verse number 10. After we get saved by grace, in verse 8 and 9, not of works lest any man should boast, verse 10, Paul says this, after you get saved, verse 10, for we, those of us that are saved, are His, God's. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Uh, we see the Savior's work for us. It says here in verse 10, we are his workmanship. Uh, I, I can't ever read verses like that, but what I don't think about being a little kid growing up in Sunday school, and, and those of you that have, you remember the old song we used to say, He's still working on me, making me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make a move, he's still working on me. Y'all remember that song? And uh, that's the truth. Now, I realize that's a kid's song. And, and I realize, you know, if we was to stand up and sing that for 11 o'clock Sunday morning, we'd all sit here and say, well, dear God, what are they singing some little old kid song for? But there's a whole lot more truth in that song if you really think about it. The Lord is working on us. Uh, from the time we get saved to the time we go home, uh, the Lord begins to do a good work in us. Paul terms it this way in Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it, Unto the day of Jesus Christ. Once you got saved, God started chipping away at you. God saved your soul, but He's working on the rest of us too. And uh, here the Bible says we are His workmanship. God's doing something on us. God's doing something in us. God's doing something through us. I looked up this word workmanship, 
And, and you ought to catch this this morning because it blessed my heart. Now, I, I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm no big uh, Greek of fire, no big Greek and Hebrew person. I know, you know, I, you hear preachers sometimes, it's like every other word of their message, they throw out some Greek word and tell you some Greek word and, and all this. And the common man in the sits there saying, what's that got to do with me? Praise God, I, I speak English. I don't speak Greek. I don't speak Hebrew. That don't do nothing for me. Uh, and a lot of times guys do that to try and correct the English, to correct the King James Bible. But this morning I looked up that word workmanship, and it was interesting to me. The Greek word where the word workmanship comes from, it is the word poema, which didn't mean anything to me until I realized it's where we get our word poem from. Literally, he's saying in the text, we are God's poem. We are God's workmanship. God is writing something with our life. You ever read poems before? I'm not good at writing poems. If and when I ever write my wife love letters, I have never written her a poem. Uh, I'm not good at it. Uh, rhyming is not my game. I, I, some of y'all may be. Some of y'all may be able to throw a poem out, man. And I've got some friends that they write poems and they're great. And, and it's a way for people, a, a release for people in their life and things they're going through. I'm no big poem writer. If I write my wife something, it'll just be a letter. It probably won't rhyme. If I did, it would start off with roses are red and violets are blue. You know, and God knows where it's going to go from there. You know, it, it <laughs> could get rid could get real off the beaten path somewhere after that. So I'm no big poem writer. But what it's saying here is this word workmanship, poema, where we get our word poem from. God is writing something in our life that brings Him glory. You ever read poems before? Poems have, uh, they have ups and downs. Happy parts and sad parts. And they start way over here and they walk you through generally the scene of an entire life. And it ends up in a happy ending somewhere. That's what God's doing with our life. He is literally writing a living poem with your life. If you can look back and see your life, how God's writing it out, you'd see times when you cried. You'd see times when you shouted. You'd see times when you failed and you sinned. And you'd see times when you walked with God. But as God's writing this poem and we see the story of the poem, it all ends up working out so He gets all the glory. He gets all the praise and he gets all the honor for it. We are his workmanship. We are his poem. I also like this word workmanship. Uh, I, I, I want you to go all the way back to the book of Exodus with me. This word workmanship. We're God's workmanship. God's working on us. Go back to Exodus 31 with me. Uh, when you're studying your Bible, uh, as you're reading your Bible and studying your Bible, that there's some that everybody ought to take into account and use along and along. If you're going to study to show yourself approved unto God, the workman needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We looked at that verse uh, in a big way last week. If you're going to be not just a casual observer of the word of God, but a studier, what I'm fixing to tell you, you will need. There, there is what we call the law of first mention. If you're studying your Bible and you come across the word... And you say, man, that, that, that word, that, there's something in that word. That word's, man, that, I, I'd like to study that word out. The first place to start in any word study is to look up the first time it was ever mentioned in the Bible. And generally, if you go back and look up the very first time that a word was ever mentioned in the Bible, it will give light on the next time that it's mentioned all the way through the book. Take, for instance, the word love. You know when the word love is first shows up in your Bible? The first mention of the word love is Genesis 22. God tells Abraham to go sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah. And this is what God said. He said, take thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and offer him for sacrifice. You say, well, why is that interesting? Because Genesis 22 is an awesome picture of God, of Abraham, a picture of God, offering up his son Jesus Christ for you and I. And God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So those things tie in together. The first mention of a singular lamb in your Bible is in Genesis 22. Well, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? We realize that's pointing towards Jesus Christ later on. The first mention of the word spirit in your Bible. The Bible said in the beginning, uh, 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 God created the heavens and the earth, the earth without form and void, darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved. He began to breathe. He began to move on the face of those dark waters. And God said, let there be light. You say, what's that got to do with us? It's a picture of how the Spirit works in our life. You were just dead. 
in the dark. And one day the Spirit of God moved on your life, breathed on your life, and brought light into your life. So here we're going to find the first time we see the word workmanship. If you're studying your Bible, go back and find the first mention of a particular word that you're studying. And we're going to do that with workmanship. And it has so much to do with what we're talking about in Ephesians 2 with God working on us. Exodus 31, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. Now here in the text we find they're about to build the tabernacle. This gray tent in the wilderness uh, that God, cut the Shekinah glory of God came down on. It's the place where they set the Ark of the Covenant in the holy place in the back of it. And in the, in the, in the, in the court of the tabernacle they had the candlestick and the table of the showbread and the incense. And then out in the outer court they had the altar where they offered up the sacrifices and the labor where they washed their hands. So they're fixing to build this temple. And watch what it says in verse 3. The Lord said, And I have filled him, I've filled Bezalel, with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner, here's the word, first time it's mentioned in the King James Bible, workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones, to set them and in carving of timber, to work in all manner of, he says it twice, workmanship. You say, what's that got to do with what we're looking at in Ephesians 2? Well, here in the text we find there is a man that God uses to set things in the tabernacle as God sees fit. He is constructing a place for God's habitation. God is going to come down and cohabit with man. He's going to set down with man, tabernacle with man in this great tent. And this fella is working things to give God a place to be comfortable at. That's what Paul's saying he's doing with us all the way over in Ephesians 2. We're his workmanship. Do you realize the Bible said your body is the temple, the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost? You know what God does through reading your Bible, through praying, through trials and tribulations, through preaching, through walking with God? God is doing the same thing this guy was doing on the tabernacle. He's constructing a place that God can feel comfortable in. He's throwing things out that offends God. He's pulling things in that pleases God. You are the tabernacle now. You are the temple. Somebody said this was a great, great statement years ago. They said in the Old Testament, God had a tabernacle for His people. But in the New Testament, God has a people for His tabernacle. That's pretty good out right there. I wish I'd come up with that, but I didn't. I can't lie and say it did. In the Old Testament, God had a tabernacle for His people to worship in. But now in the New Testament, God has a people for His tabernacle. God, God don't, I realize we have set this place apart as the house of God. And we appreciate that. But you realize this place is, is not like an Old Testament temple where God exclusively meets. We can go meet out under the oak tree out there and God can show up. Why? Because my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He's in me. God, Christ, in you, the hope of glory. And God is a working on us. He's chipping away at us. He's performing a work on us. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Come all the way over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. This ought to be a verse that, that when I say 2 Corinthians 5, 17, uh, if you've lived for God any length of time at all, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you're not to have to even turn there. You're going to be able to start, stand up right now and quote it. There ought to be some hallmark verses that you have hid in your heart that you might not sin against God. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is one of them. It's one of those verses that you should commit to your memory. You say, preacher, I don't have that committed to memory. You ought to start this week. Paste it up on your mirror. Paste it on your refrigerator. Paste it on your speedometer. Keep it somewhere where you're going to see it on a regular basis. This is a good one. You need to have this one in your heart. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul said this. Therefore... If any man be in Christ, he is a new what? He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God is a doing something in our life. When you get saved, old things start fading away. New things start coming in. You got a new nature. You got, you got a new personality even. You got a new spirit living inside of you. Now listen, I realize when you get saved... 
Everything ain't done away with. Did any of y'all like sweet tea before y'all got saved? Anybody like sweet tea before you got saved? Raise your hand. All right, put your hands down. How many of y'all like sweet tea since you've been saved? Well, I didn't. I didn't pass away. You know, there are some things you bring out of the old life into the new life ain't necessarily sin and ain't nothing wrong with it. But there are some things once you get in Christ, God starts working on your life to cut them out. God starts working to get them out. Uh, God starts dealing with you about some of those old habits, some of those old words, some of those old places you went, some of those old friends you hung around. And I realize for some Christians it takes a little longer for some Christians to mature and God to cut some things out than it does some other Christians. But let me say this to you. If you're saved, you should remember a day in your life to where you became a new creature. Where you started thinking a little different. You started talking a little different. You start out. Here's the acid test to know if somebody's been saved. Here, here's a place to take somebody. If you're ever dealing with them in personal work and they can't figure out if they've ever been saved, am I saved, am I lost, they never get saved. I'm not saying this, you know, I realize there are exceptions to every rule. But here's a real good acid test. Ask, not, don't just ask them, do you remember the place you got saved? Ask them this. Do you remember the day when you became a new creature? I mean when you started thinking different. When the things that used to didn't bother you, after whatever place it was where you trusted Christ, they started bothering you. Things you used to be able to participate in, now it started bothering you. Now look here. I'm not talking about since a Christian's been saved. He ain't, he's not sinless, but he should sin less. There's now aware, an awareness of sin you didn't have. You remember before you got saved, there was stuff you did, stuff you thought, and it didn't bother you a bit. It didn't bother you to be drunk. It didn't bother you to cuss. It didn't bother you to look at pornography. It didn't bother you to lust after somebody. It didn't bother you to cheat. It didn't bother you to steal. It didn't bother you to lie. That stuff didn't bother you. But son, if you've ever been saved... When you trusted Christ, there should be a new awareness of sin. You do those things now and something says, you know that ain't right. Hey, you can't do that. You can't do that and please God. Something moved in that's different. It's a new creature. And this new creature that moved in, he, he creates in us the desire for good works. Now listen to me. The Christian does not work to get saved. He works because he is saved. He doesn't work to keep itself saved. He works because he is saved. Back, back to uh, Ephesians 2 here. And we're going to run some more references. But back to Ephesians 2. Look what it says here. It said we are his workmanship. This new creature he's made in us. And he's still working on us. We are his workmanship. And watch what we're created to. We are created. The new creature. Created in Christ Jesus unto what? We're created unto good works. God, listen to what I'm fit to tell you. God loves you just like you are, but He won't leave you like you are. Amen. Right. When, God, look, look, this, this modern day, this modern day come as you are, leave as you came idea, this, this modern day church to where they make just everybody feel good any way they are, that's garbage and hogwash. Listen to me. If you're a lost sinner going to hell, Look here, God will take you just like you are. God will, God will take you right smack dab in the middle of your filthy sin. God will take a drunk. God will take a whoremonger. God will take a homo. God will take anybody just like they are. But once they get saved, God refuses to leave them that way. And if you're still that way five and ten years after you got saved, I doubt you ever got saved. Because when God moves in, we are created, this new creature is created to do good works. He does, don't get the order messed up. That's where your Pentecostals and your Church of Gods all get it messed up. They say the works come first and then that gives the salvation. No, 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 no. Salvation comes first and that provides the good works. That's what provides us the good works. And we are created to do good works. And now this time, the day we live in, they, they, they act like this. They act like you can still be just like you was before you got saved. And no big deal. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to tell you something, brother. Not only is God not happy with that thing just because He's a holy and a righteous God and He lives inside of you, but He wants a testimony out of your life to show that lost and dying world that something happened to you. God help us. I was just talking with a preacher just the other day. And uh, he knows an individual that, uh, uh, that's in his family. That they're, not, they're not, maybe not even saved. 
And they don't go to church very often. They just kind of live for this world and live for themselves. And they just open up a liquor store. Open up a place where they sell liquor and got a drive through for it and all that kind of thing. And the preacher was talking with this individual that's in his family. And they called him the other day and this is what they said. They said, you'll never guess who was the first one to use our drive through to buy liquor the other day. He said, who? And they named his name and I know exactly who it is. It's a preacher I used to preach for. He used to be a pastor. Now he's out of the ministry and don't even go to church. And that individual in this preacher, in this pastor's family that was talking to me, that individual that runs this place, is using that now as an opportunity to prove why Christianity is just phony and it's just fake. And see, he used to be a preacher, and he the first one to come through our drive through to buy liquor. Well, tell you, Fred, there's going to be some blood on the hands of some of God's people at the judgment because of the testimony you lived in front of people's lives. The attitude you displayed and the things you allowed to go on in your life and the lost people was watching that and saying, well, if that's Christians, and that's, that don't, now look here, that don't give them no excuse. They, they still need God and they don't give them no excuse. I'm going to tell you what, friend, they're looking at your life and if your life kicks them off into hell, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. We ought to have a life. It's not perfect. It's not snooty and holier than thou and sticking your nose up in the air. You can get off in the ditch on either side. Yeah. Trying to be some prideful Pharisee that thinks you're better than everybody else. That disgusts the world. And then trying to get down in the gutter with the world and act like you're buddies with them and keep on drinking with them and keep on smoking dope with them and keep on fornicating with them. That's a joke too. Yeah. We're right in the middle. I'm not what I used to be and I'm not what I always ought to be. But I'm just an old saved sinner that's trying to do the best to live for God. And I'm going to try to show a lost and dying world there's something different about me. Amen. Amen. Look at the good works. Paul, Paul hammers on these good works in the book of Titus. Come to the book of Titus chapter 1. Now the reason why Titus, the book of Titus is so pertinent for you and I uh, as Christians living in America is this. Paul was writing to this preacher boy Titus. And Titus is in a place where he's ministering called Crete. Crete is just a little old island uh, out in the Mediterranean. And the Cretans, that's, that's the designation of the Cretes, the Cretans, they are some of those carnal, wicked people uh, that there was. Matter of fact, Paul says down here about the Cretans uh, in verse number 12. Look at Titus 1, 12. Look at where this preacher boy Titus is having to minister at. Titus 1.12, he said, One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Verse 13, this witness is true. That's the people poor old Titus got to witness to. That's the people poor old Titus got to preach to. A, a bunch of real, real, wicked, ungodly sinners. Now listen to me. We can take something from the book of Titus because we're living in that environment today. Dear God, we're living in an environment now here. Have I don't know if y'all been keeping up with the news or not, but I'll tell you how messed up we have become in our society. Our leaders, the people that are leading our country, believe that now it is not only okay to abort a child when it is still just a little embryo or just a little small fetus, it is okay to abort this child at a full nine months when it is delivered out of the womb at a full nine months. It is okay to bring... That's what the governor of Virginia said. Yep. And it's okay to bring them out the womb. He said keep them relatively comfortable and then basically decide if you want to keep it or kill it. That's murder, man. Lock him up. Like, bam, lock him up. That's, that's infanticide. And we are in such a wicked, ungodly day that they think this is okay. Not, not one, not one liberal Democrat came out and voiced a disapproving voice for what that man said. Not one. You want to know when they came out and started disapproving, calling for his Come resignation? On, yeah. Come on. Right. Two days later, it came out that in some yearbook when he was a kid in college or high school, that him and a friend of his, one of his friends is a gag dressed up in a Ku Klux Klan outfit, and the other one dressed up as a black guy. Now, I'm against racism. Brother, we're against racism here. We love red, yellow, black, and white. Jesus died for all of them. Amen, amen. amen. Jesus died for all of them. Uh, in amen. Hey, I got... I, a black man's my brother if he's saved just like a white man is. But this is the problem where we're at, how messed up we are. After that came out, same guy, same guy that said we can kill babies when they come out nine months old, 
Same guy that dressed up, either he was the guy that painted himself black or he was the guy in the Ku Klux Klan outfit. When that come out, every liberal Democrat now says, he's got to resign. He's, got, he's immoral. He's got to resign. Yeah. Well, let me, let me just pause right here and say this. And everybody needs to hear this real good. If you believe, if you believe that it is more, that it is more morally repugnant to kid around and joke in a racist form like that, than it is to be a murderer of nine month old children. You are a moral mental reprobate and I cannot help you. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Listen to what I'm saying to you. If you think it is worse to be in joking and playing around about racism than it is to murder our children. If you're sitting here this morning saying, yeah, that's worse than that. I can't help you. You're a mental reprobate, friend. You're past help. I'm telling you the Democratic Party as a whole, they're past help. They're gone. They're gone. They're out. They're checked out and they're gone. Ain't no hope for them. Sorry, they, they, it's, it's a place, Romans chapter 1. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And so you know what God did? God flipped the lights off and said, all right, I'm out. I'll not come back. I'll leave you to yourself. That's what we're seeing in our day. That's the kind of country where Titus is. Evil beats, liars, slow bellies. In other words, they live for the flesh. And so look what Paul says. Because of that, we're talking about living good works. Because he's living in such a wicked society, look how many times Paul hammers on good works, good works, good works. Show them something different. Titus 1.16. Titus 1.16. They profess that they know God. I mean, shoot, man. Hillary Clinton professes she knows God. She does. Barack Obama claimed to know God. All, all them folks claim they know God. That don't mean nothing. Watch what it said. They profess they know God. Even the devils believe and tremble, baby. That's right. But in works, they deny him, being abominable, disobedient unto every good work, reprobate. Yep. Chapter 2, verse 7. Chapter 2, verse 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing corruptness, gravity, sincerity. Let's keep moving. Verse 14. Verse 14. Talking about Jesus. He gave, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purifying himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. I mean, Paul's just hammering this thing to old Titus. Chapter 3, verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Let me take a time out right there. Paul said this is a faithful saying. I will that thou affirm constantly. If you're living in a wicked society, you have to preach on this stuff constantly. That they which have believed in God, those which have been saved. Let me ask you a question. Have you believed in God and been saved? All right. You want to listen to me? You're going to get a steady dose and diet from this pulpit on a regular basis on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights on living a life with a good testimony. Say, why are you going to preach that stuff to us all the time? Because we live in the same kind of society Titus did. Amen. And this society is so wicked, they need to see something that's more than just religion. They need to see a Christian that looks different, talks different, acts different, thinks different. The whole nine, baby. Amen. I will that thou affirm this constantly. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto me. Verse 14. Here it is again. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. Paul over and over and over to Titus says, they're watching you, Titus. Them Christians are watching you. I let, Paul left Titus in Crete. Titus ain't from Crete. On one of Paul's missionary journeys, he sailed by there and <laughs> dug the old preacher boy off and said, do the best you can, buddy. I'll be back to get you after a while. <laughs> I, I sometimes wonder about that. Brother John, I sometimes wonder about that. Here's two preacher boys. Paul has three people that he calls his sons after the flesh. Only three. And they're all Gentiles. All three of them, all Gentiles. We're going to look at the Gentile thing in a minute. One of them's Titus. One of them's Timothy. And one of them is Onesimus. Written in the book of Philemon. All three of them are Gentiles. And they're the only ones that Paul said, these are my sons after the faith. And they're all Gentiles. Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. And old, Tim, old Timothy... Paul leaves him with the church at Ephesus. That's the church we've been teaching to you about. The church of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. That, the pastor of that church is Timothy. 
The books of 1 and 2 Timothy are written to the pastor of, of the people of the Ephesians, which is Timothy. It seems like a pretty good job. The Ephesian job seems like a pretty good job. All this of them folks kind of grounded and rooted. and They love Timothy and Timothy loves them. Well, praise God, what a blessing. T Timothy gets Ephesians. <laughs> Timothy gets Ephesus, Brother Mike. Poor old Titus. I don't know what Titus done wrong, but Titus, you don't get the cushy job in Ephesus. You got to stay on this little island over here on Crete with these evil beasts, these slow bellies, these liars. That's the ministry you get. <laughs> I watch some people's ministries and I think, man, I sure am glad I'm a Bible missionary. <laughs> 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 Woo, thank God I'm a Bible missionary. And I didn't get stuck with the Cretans wherever they were. I mean, look here, God's a lot of life for some people. They have to go to the Cretans, man. Rough ministry, plowing ministry, hard ministry. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't call them. I just play them like God sees them. But uh, old Titus goes to these Christians, and over and over, the Lord is telling Titus, keep your good works, keep your good works. You're living in such a wicked society, they need to see a light. And we're in such a wicked society, they need to see a light. Sister, they need to see your light. Brother, they need to see your light. All right, we're back to the workmanship here. We're back to back to Ephesians. Back to Ephesians. It said, uh, verse 10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Verse 11. Verse 11, moving on along here. Uh, he said, wherefore, remember. Don't, don't forget this now. Just because you start walking with God and just because you've been saved and just because now you're starting to live a life of good works, don't forget where you come from. Wherefore, remember, listen to me. It's real easy sometimes for Christians to forget where God got them. Sometimes it's easy for us to forget the hell hole we is in when Jesus saved us. You know, sometimes we forget <laughs> we've lived so long with the Lord and we've lived good work so long. Some of us, some of us forget that you used to like to drink liquor. And you used to like to smoke dope. And you used to like to do this and do that and be, you know, lay out on Sunday and whatever. And so he's trying to remind them, look, just because you're doing the good works now, have some compassion on people. Remember, you used to be there. You used to didn't see any need for God or any need for church or anything. You, you was there one time too. He said, wherefore remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, in the flesh made by hands. The uncircumcision, that's the Gentiles. Circumcision, that's the Jew. Verse 12. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. The people that Paul is writing to in this text are saved Gentiles. You say, preacher, I keep reading this Gentile thing, Gentile thing in my Bible, and I keep hearing you talk about Gentile and you. What is... What is a Gentile? Anybody that's not a Jew is a Gentile. Do we have any Jews in the building this morning? If we do, raise your hand. Anybody got any Jewish descent? Anybody any Jewish descent? All right. Every last one of us are Gentiles. You all Gentiles sitting in the building. We're all that people, friend. You, you realize something? And uh, there's a reason why we're for the Jews. God's going to restore them back to their former glory down the road. But right now, blindness and parks happen to them. You realize something, though, about this book you're reading? You realize that's a Jewish book. We're all a bunch of Gentiles, and that's a Jewish book. You realize there's not one book, 66 books that make up this one book. There's not, there's not one book in 66 that was written by a Gentile. We're reading a totally Jew. Every author in that book is a Jewish author. The Bible said the oracles are given to the Jews. You realize the Savior you worship is a Jewish Savior? Yeah. I mean, people get so messed up. You know, the white supremacists, the white supremacists trying to act like Jesus is white. Jesus is some Aryan, you know, Nazi, and he's white. And the black supremacists, you know, they put out black Jesuses and Jesus is some black panther. I got news for all of them. Jesus ain't white and Jesus ain't black. Sorry. Jesus is an olive-skinned, dark-headed Jew. <laughs> The God that you serve and the Savior that you glorify and the one we're going to shout about here in just a little bit and glorify, he is a Jew. And if you are anti-Semitic, you have a real problem with your Savior this morning. Because he's a Jew. And the Bible said he's going to get the throne of his father David. He's going to come back as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, King of the Jews, baby. He's a Jew. Uh, I, I preach in a little old church up in the hills of Kentucky. Good church. 
Good little old place, but I'm talking about it's in the nowhereville, Brother Tim. Literally, literally, when I get out there, there's no cell phone reception 10 miles that way or 10 miles that way. You remember being up there, uh, Mama? And uh, we parked our motor home out there. I mean, we was in the sticks. The boondocks. I ain't never been that far before. I got out and I started listening for banjos. Praise God. If I started hearing banjos, loading stuff up, Mama, let's get out of here. Amen. That's right. I mean, it's way back up. And, uh, we walked up in the church, little old, little old bitty church in front of Danny. We walked up in there, and on the back, there's this super huge mural that somebody had painted some years past on the back of the church. And this super huge mural is old Leonardo da Vinci's, you know, rendering of the Last Supper. You know, all them guys sitting around the table with Jesus, eating the Last Supper, and, you know, fantasies from a Roman Catholic, you know, Leonardo and all that. And, uh, and all of them's white guys sitting around the table. Some of them got blonde hair. <laughs> they was all Jews. They was all 100% thoroughbred Jews. <laughs> and right smack dab in the middle of it, I couldn't help it. I made mention of it. One of my messages, it tickled me so much, and I laughed. Right smack dab in the middle of Brother Cliff, there sits Jesus. And Jesus is a dude as white as I am with blonde hair and a blonde beard. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't know, I don't know why I don't know exactly what Jesus looked like, but I promise you, he didn't look like that. I mean, whoever drew that thing obviously was some sort of backwoods neo Nazi Aryan racist uh, from way back in the day. He probably had, you know, uh, probably had some sort of swastika hanging up in his garage, and he thought, well, when I'm going to draw Jesus, I'm going to make him a white Aryan white man. <laughs> Uh, I was preaching up there, and when I was preaching, I somehow got to talk about Jesus, and I hammered down by who Jesus was, and I said, now, I don't know who this guy is back here, but uh, that ain't Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was a Jew. They took it pretty good. They invited me so much. <laughs> it's funny to me. It's funny to me. Uh, we're Gentiles, but... but uh, the uncircumcision called the circumcision. And it said in verse 12, at that time you were without Christ. Now these people understand a whole lot more of what it's like to be stuck in the dark without God. Uh, the Gentiles had all their pagan gods and all that stuff. And they went full on in their own way going to hell. If you read Genesis, you go back and read the book of Genesis. From chapter number 11 all the way through that Old Testament, you find the decline of the Gentile race. Genesis 11 is the Tower of Babel. And in Genesis 11, all them Gentiles get together and they say, let's make us a tower going all the way up unto heaven. We're going to be like God. And God come over there and looked down at that big old Empire State building they was building. And when he looked down at that thing, he said, uh, man's trying to get up here where we are. They're trying to be like God. And God come down, confounded the languages. And all of a sudden, while they was building one day, one of them turned to the other one and he said, good talk. The other one turned to him and he said, uh, he said, what gives, man? I ain't never heard that kind of talk before. And one over here, he said, adios, amigos. And they said, man, what in the world are you saying? God, I mean, right there on the spot, God changed the languages. I want to mess them all up. And from Genesis 11, the Gentiles go this way. And in Genesis chapter 12, you know what happens in Genesis 12? God calls a man out of Ur of the Chaldees named Abraham, and he's going to be the first Jew. God gives him the sign of circumcision. And from that point till you get to the cross of Calvary, the Gentiles go like that. And from Genesis 12 to Malachi, the Jews get all the goods and the Gentiles go downhill. Genesis 11, the Gentiles go that way. God nationally, na now individually, God still deals with some Gentiles in the Old Testament. Individually. But nationally, God deals with nothing but a Jew in the Old Testament. There's not one great nation of Gentiles that serves God in the Old Testament. The only nation that serves God in the Old Testament is a Jew nation. The only one. Gentiles go this way after Genesis 11. Jews go toward God. And I know they in and out, in and out, but they don't want close to God. And now there's, there's exceptions. Like I say, there's, there's Gentiles in the Old Testament that God pulls out, and it's a picture, it's a type, it's a foreshadow of what God was going to do with you and me down the road when we got saved. Jericho. God saves old harlot over there named Rahab. Has her tie that scarlet cord, a picture of the blood. It's a picture of us. The Gentiles got in. Uh, uh, Ruth, old Ruth over there. Miss Tristan has been teaching you ladies about Ruth on Wednesday night. She's a picture of us. She's an old Gentile. She's a Moabitess. She's a half-breed Jew. Her, dad, her daddy's great-great-great-granddaddy's Lot and, 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 and Lot's daughter come from an ancestral relationship. That's where Moab come from. She's just no half-breed. 
What happens to her? She gets in the family of Jesus Christ. So did Rahab. Rahab the harlot ended up marrying up and her son ends up being Boaz. Rahab's son ends up being Boaz, the one that Trish was teaching about on Wednesday night. Maybe I'll just give something away and shouldn't have. Y'all act like you didn't hear that. There's more types in chapter David. David, David is, David go, David's family gets taken away over there in 1 Samuel 30 or 31. Ziklag gets burnt with fire. And when David goes back to recover his wives and his children and his stuff, the Bible said he found an Amalekite in the field. David the king finds an old Gentile Amalekite dying in the field. And David gives him bread and gives him water and brings him back to life. It's a picture of us. The, Jim, the Jewish king come down and found us in the field. And saved us. Them t pictures are all through the Old Testament. But nationally, the Gentiles go down and the Jews come up. But after Calvary, yep. something happens. Yep. At Calvary, this is what the Jews say. Old Caesar walks out on that big old platform and he's got the king of the Jews standing right there next to him. The king of the Jews. The son of man, the son of God. David's son that's going to sit on the throne of David. And he looks at that crowd and he said, Whom would you rather that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? And they said, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a murderer. And this is what old, this is what old Pilate says. Pilate says, Shall I crucify your king? And this is what the Jews say. We have no king but Caesar. God said, oh, you got no king but Caesar? Y'all know what Caesar is. That's wrong. You got no king but Caesar? And then they say this. His blood be on us and on our children. Oh, God wasn't, God wasn't deaf sitting up there. He heard them. Those were the Jewish fathers. The nation's fathers made that choice. You don't want no king but Rome? That's right, God. We don't want no king but Rome. That man's blood going to be on you and your children? That's right. All right. 70 years later, 70 AD, Titus, the Roman general, comes through and murders them and wipes them all out. Puts them under a boot of Roman authority for years and years and years. You want to get worse than that? We're going to come all the way through and we're going, God's going to pull a man up and, uh, named Hitler. Oh, Hitler's a full-fledged Roman Catholic. Yep. Joseph Goebbels, a full-fledged Roman yep. Catholic. Yep. Ditto every Nazi, every yep. one of the Nazis on, Hil on Hitler's staff was all full-fledged, papal-loving, pope-kissing, mass-taking Roman Catholics yep. and had the full-fledged sanction and backing of the Roman Catholic Church to genocide millions of Jews. Do you know what countries took the Nazis in after the World War II was over with in 1945? You know where they all fled to? They fled to Argentina and Venezuela and Brazil. You know why? Them was countries that were allegiant and held under Roman Catholic control when the Pope had pull and ties down there. And they all went to them Roman Catholic countries to hide out. That's where they found old uh, Joseph Mengele, the doctor of death, angel of death, did all them experiments on them little twins. That's where they found old... Uh, Oh, his name slipped my mind. Oh, gone it. Another one of them real big high up Hitler men that murdered all them Jews. Anyways, God was a listening. You don't want nobody but Rome? All right, nationally, I'm going to let Rome wipe you out. And that blood's been required now for 2,000 years on that group. And now the difference is God's been working with Gentile nations. God blessed a place called England. God made a printing press over there. God brought out Gutenberg Bible out of Germany and then God brought out a King James Bible out of England and God sent missionaries all over the world from England. God blessed a nation, a Gentile nation. Then what happened? Then England went dark and then America, a Gentile nation, started sending missionaries all over the world and started being the bastion for truth and now America's about to go dark. You say, what's fixing to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. The rapture of the church is going to happen. God's fixing to be done with the time of the Gentiles and God's going to go back to dealing with them Jews in the tribulation. That thing went, Gentiles go down, Jews come up. After the cross, Gentiles go up, Jews go down. Tribulation's going to happen. It's going to do this way again. <laughs> God's got that whole thing worked out, man. You, you ain't nothing but an old, old, old uh, Elvis Presley. He was a lot smarter than people give him credit for. He sung that song, He ain't nothing but a hound dog. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. He ain't never caught a rabbit. He ain't nothing. Anyway. I'm looking at a bunch of dogs. You look at a dog preacher. You know that's what Gentiles are called? Gentile dogs. That's what Jesus called a woman over in Matthew 15. He said it, a Gentile woman come to get help. He said it's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. It was a racial slur against us Gentiles. That's all we are. I'm a Gentile dog. Say what happened? 
I got in with a good Jewish master. And he throwed me some bread of life. <laughs> now I'm in the family. All right, we got to close right there. We got to close right there. Uh, we'll pick it back up next week at the end of verse 12. No hope without God in the world. Father, I pray you bless the Sunday school time. Thank you so much for what you're doing in our life. Help us, Lord, to remember, as Paul told Titus, to maintain good works. Help us to leave out of here, Lord, trying to live a life that gives you glory and a testimony in the eyes of the lost world. Help us to remember, Lord, that we was just old Gentiles lost without God until one day the light of the glorious gospel of Christ shined unto us. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Help us now in the preaching hour in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're dismissed at 11 o'clock.